good to see everybody again. I feel like reaching out and giving everyone like a huge big virtual hug <laughs> because I just love all of you and I'm so excited to see all of you all the time. And um, yeah, I've just um, been had a chat, been chatting with, with a friend of mine and we've realized that I've stepped into season two of my Rise series. So it actually started two episodes ago. The God has shifted me from season one of Arise into season two of Arise, and um, I only picked up the shift a little bit, a little bit late. I felt it, but I didn't, wasn't sure about actually putting it like that. But it seems that that is a good idea. So this would be episode three of season two of Arise, and um, I'm excited because I know that God has got so much in store for everybody, and He's just pouring out his word at the moment and his presence and everything else. So I hope you are well. I hope you are strong in the Lord. I hope your faith is moving mountains. <laughs> and I hope you are rejoicing in Jesus because he is so worth rejoicing in. And I just want to say again, I now have a website. I have a website, people, a proper professional website. So please feel free to go to www.sallygoodwin.com. I know it's been appearing on my screen right since the beginning, but it's taken a little while to actually get it all together. So I have a website now. You can subscribe to a weekly devotional. You can see all my teachings. They're on video and podcast. So you have the choice of doing one or the other. And then obviously there's still Facebook, Instagram, WhatsApp, Facebook Messenger. There's so many ways you could reach out to me that there is absolutely no excuse for you not reaching out to me because you, in this day of technology, it doesn't matter where you are in the world, it doesn't matter who you are in the world, you can reach out directly to me and we can chat. And how exciting is that? So I am excited and I'm encouraging you to contact me. Oh, and I also have an email address. Although it seems to me that even email these days isn't everyone's first choice anymore. It's more like the other things. The social media Media stuff is better. Anyway, welcome everybody. It's so good to see you again. Um, I have something that's one of the, <laughs> the words that God has given me, but it's one of these words which comes from a Bible story. You know, I mean, everything comes from a Bible story, but it's like a Bible story I remember hearing when I was a child. And I think I said in one of my previous videos so often, especially if you've been raised in Sunday school and raised in the church, you hear these stories, you know, you've heard these Bible stories, um, but you, you don't always, because you've just heard them over and over again, and they've been lovely little stories, you don't always realize the depth of the meaning behind them until God actually just sort of peels away that veil or just gives you that little extra layer of revelation, which is just amazing. So the first episode of season two I spoke about the changes in the church or the changes in the way that we do church. Uh, so basically, it sort of came down to what the church should look like in the world, you know, what the body of Christ should be bringing to the world. And then in the second episode, I spoke about each one of us as individuals needing to be the plumb line, you know, that Amos refers to in, in the book of Amos, the, the standard that's the standard that is set and how we need to be that that person, no matter what our circumstances, no matter where we are, we are all called to be a standard bearer. bearer. We are all called to be that plumb line for the Lord. And afterwards, uh, when I was chatting it through with, with one or two friends, um, it occurred in conversation that possibly it's difficult to see yourself as a standard bearer or as a plumb line if you're not sure of your identity in Jesus or if you still think or feel like there are things that hold you back. Now, if you watched season one, um, my testimony, my own personal testimony is, is, in, is in there. You can go and listen to that and that will tell you very clearly that um, nothing holds you back from God's destiny for your life. Nothing. And um, so all of those things I'm trusting will have guided you to this point where you're able to actually step into being everything God has called you to be and a part of the corporate bride of Christ. But I still wanted to just go over this this story with you 
And so basically, Jesus has had me reading Luke 19, and I was actually reading something else. And then he kind of kept highlighting, Holy Spirit kept highlighting the beginning of Luke 19 to me. And I was like, okay, let me go there. So the bit that I was um, thinking about, speaking about, will come next time. But it's the story of Zacchaeus. And I feel like it really just speaks to like, who are we, you know? Um, and the story of Zacchaeus is such a, it's such a good story. And it's, as I've said, it's one of those Bible stories that are told over and over. So you don't always understand or get the full meaning of it. So I just wanted to go over it with you. So I'm reading from the Passion Translation uh, because it just is, it's, it sounds lovely in the Passion Translation. And it's Luke 19 and it's verse 1 to 10. And it's the story of, of Zacchaeus. And it says, in the city of Jericho, there lived a very wealthy man named Zacchaeus who was the supervisor over all the tax collectors. Now, I need to stop right there because I just want to point something out to you. The name Zacchaeus means pure. That's actually what his name means. It means pure. But the life that he was living and the way he was living it was far from pure. So Isaiah 49 verse 1 says this, Listen to this, everyone, near and far. The Eternal One singled me out, even before I was born. He called me and named me when I was still in my mother's belly. That's from the message translation. And this, that verse from Isaiah, and it is Isaiah speaking about himself, but it applies to all of us. He, God called us and named us all while we were still in our mother's womb. Names are important. I have a friend who her whole life, she felt as if her name didn't fit. She just felt as if she should have been called something else. Now, I know often when you're a child, you know, you wish you were called something else or you don't like your name or you think your friend has a cooler name or something. But she, right up into adulthood, she just felt that her name didn't fit. And so she went to the Lord and she said to the Lord, you know, why do I feel like this? Like my name doesn't fit who I am. And God said to her, because your name should have actually been this. And she was like, what do you mean? He said, that was what your mother was supposed to call you, was this name. And she actually went to her mom and asked her mom. And her mom said, yes, that was what I was going to call you. And then family had gotten involved. And, you know, people give their opinions on names and things. And then you think, okay, no, I'm not going to go with that one. So they had actually changed the name to something different. And she actually went and had her name changed officially back to what her mom was originally going to call her and her whole life just like slotted into place. Everything just made perfect sense to her, you know. I mean, um, my name means princess, but it means warrior princess. Now, I can be a princess, but I'm also a warrior. <laughs> so names are very important. I just wanted you to understand that. And I wanted you to see as well that Zacchaeus's name and his life didn't tie up. So Zacchaeus was a chief tax collector which means he was actually over the other tax collectors. Now, the tax collectors at that time were Jewish men who collected taxes from the Jews on behalf of the Romans. They were despised by the other Jews. They, they, their testimony wasn't, didn't hold up, hold up in court. They were considered irredeemable according to the law of Moses. They, they were irredeemable. That's what they were considered. They were, there was no redemption for them as far as the Jewish people were concerned. And Zacchaeus not only was a chief tax collector, he was what they called then a publican, which was um, a wealthy man who could pay to collect taxes in certain areas. So he would pay for the right to collect taxes in certain areas, obviously the wealthier areas. And what they did was they cheated the Jewish people out of money. They overtaxed them to line their own pockets. And then if they were wealthy, they lived lives that were more uh, sort of in line with the Roman, you know, the Roman people than they did with the Jewish people. So they were, they were hated. They were despised. They were abhorred. They were dishonest. You know, they just really weren't seen as good people in the rabbinical writings. They're referred to as robbers. And um, you'll see in scripture, they often bracketed, you know, um, down as, as thieves or as sinners, because that's what they were seen to be. So this was Zacchaeus, but his name meant pure. 
As Jesus made his way through the city, Zacchaeus was eager to see Jesus. He kept trying to get a look at him, but the crowd around Jesus was massive, and Zacchaeus was a very short man and couldn't see over the heads of the people. So he ran on ahead of everyone and climbed up a blossoming fig tree so he could get a glimpse of Jesus as he passed by. And I just want you to recognize that Zacchaeus was searching. He was searching for something. And there was the sense inside him that Jesus had the answer to what he needed. Everyone was crowding around to see Jesus. He didn't have to be one of those people. He was a wealthy man. Wealthy men didn't do things like climb sycamore trees, which are um, sycamore fig trees, which can grow up to 40 feet high. Wealthy men don't climb up trees to see, you know, carpenters from Nazareth. So everything that he did was quite out of normal behavior because he was searching. He was desperate. He didn't know it yet, but he was. When Jesus got to that place, he looked up into the tree and said, Zacchaeus, hurry on down for I am appointed to stay at your house today. That sentence is so loaded with meaning. Firstly, Jesus operated from a word of knowledge. He didn't know Zacchaeus. He didn't know who he was. And yet he looked up into the tree, which potentially if it was a blossoming tree, he wouldn't have even been able to see him. So he knew he was in the tree and he knew his name was Zacchaeus. He made use of a word of knowledge to actually call Zacchaeus into his appointed time. Because he says here, it is appointed for me to stay at your home today. In other words, what he was saying is this is a divine appointment. This is already written that I am going to stay in your home today. And, you know, I just wonder like how many of us get words of knowledge and then we are too shy or too unsure whether we're hearing God correctly to actually step out and use them. And what if that word of knowledge that we are supposed to bring is the word of knowledge that is going to draw somebody into their appointed time to meet Jesus? What if? We don't know. What if that is it? What if Jesus has an appointed time with this person and the word of knowledge that you are carrying is what he's going to bring them into it? Wouldn't that be amazing to be used like that? But to be used like that, we need to feel courageous and strong enough to step out in what God has told us. So Jesus told Zacchaeus that he knew his name. In that sentence, Zacchaeus knew that Jesus knew him. And in that sentence, Zacchaeus also knew that he had an appointed meeting with Jesus. He had been singled out from everybody else gathered there that day as being the one who needed to meet Jesus. When Jesus, uh, sorry, moving on. So he scurried down the tree and came face to face with Jesus. What happened? He searched. There was a word of knowledge. There was a, a, an appointed time. And what followed was a divine encounter. He came face to face with Jesus. He had a divine encounter right there on the streets at the bottom of that sycamore tree. He stood and looked at Jesus. As Jesus left to go with Zacchaeus, many in the crowd complained, look at this, of all the people to have dinner with, he's going to eat in the house of a crook. Sometimes God is going to give you words of knowledge for people who aren't believers. Sometimes there might be people in your family. There might be um, people who look so far from the Lord that you don't think they're ever going to make their way back. It might be the scary looking biker guy on the street. You know, it might be the guy sitting begging on the street corner. It might be the teller. It might be the, the shop assistant who helps you. It could be any one of those people. They're not believers. They, they're sinners. But Jesus has an appointed time to meet with them, and he wants to use you as the tool and the vessel to do so. And that is what it looks like when the church leaves the building. When you take those things and you go out into the world with them to call people into their appointed time to meet Jesus, that is when the church leaves the building. That's when we're doing church outside of Sundays and four walls. Zacchaeus joyously welcomed Jesus and was amazed over his gracious visits to his home. He'd been treated badly 
by the Jewish people, probably shunned, definitely shunned. But he was overwhelmed by J Jesus' graciousness, by the way Jesus was when he visited his home. And yes, he lived a life that was probably deserving of the shanin and deserving of the hostility and deserving of all of that. But Jesus looked past all of that to who he was supposed to be, to what his name actually meant. That was what he was trying to call out. You are Zacchaeus, you are called pure. I'm looking for that in you. Zacchaeus stood in front of the Lord and said, half of all that I own, I will give to the poor. And Lord, if I have cheated anyone, I promise to pay back four times as much as I stole. Now, this is what I was saying in one of the previous videos. Jesus meets you where you are. Jesus met Zacchaeus where he was, up a sycamore tree. He meets you where you are. He went to Zacchaeus' house to have dinner with him, knowing who Zacchaeus was and what he did. But encountering Jesus face to face, sitting and breaking bread with Jesus, eating a meal with Jesus, brought Zacchaeus to the point where he didn't want to stay there anymore. He didn't want to be that person. Jesus had shown him who he could be, and he wanted to be that person. He wanted to be Zacchaeus the pure, not Zacchaeus the tax collector. And so he, he makes a statement. He's, so he's going to put action to that. He's not going to just say, okay, you know what, I won't, I'll stop doing this. He goes even further than saying, I'm going to stop doing this. And he says, I will pay back people I've cheated. I, will, I promise to pay back four times as much as I stole. Now, that, that is not just a random number that he picked out of his head. That goes back to Mosaic law. If you look in Exodus, in Leviticus, in Numbers, you'll see what God says about restitution. If you've taken something from someone, how are you supposed to provide restitution? Zacchaeus was quoting the, the Mosaic law there. Jesus said to him, this shows that today life has come to you and your household, for you are a true son of Abraham. The Son of Man has come to seek out and to give life to those who are lost. In that moment, Zacchaeus could have stopped at encountering Jesus. He could have stopped at having dinner with Jesus. He could have let Jesus change his life just that much. But Jesus was putting a choice before him. And he was saying, Zacchaeus, you get to choose life. What is the opposite of life? Death the wages of sin. You get to choose life or death. Zacchaeus made his choice, but his choice came out of an action. This is what I'm going to do because I have chosen life. And then Jesus confirms, this shows that today life has come to you and your household for you are a true son of Abraham. And again, I just want to show you just as a, a little extra, um, that Jesus was quoting from Ezekiel, actually. He was quoting from Ezekiel 34, verse 16, which says in the Amplified Version, I will seek that which was lost and bring back that which has strayed, and I will bandage the hurt and the crippled and will strengthen the weak and the sick, but I will destroy the fat and the strong who have become hard-hearted and perverse. I will feed them with judgment and punishment. Now, Zacchaeus had been one of those people who was the fat, living off the fat of the land, living off the, the suffering of his people, benefiting from the suffering of his people. And he was strong. He carried authority, authority given to him by the Romans. He was regarded as unclean because of his dealings with the Romans. But he was okay with that because of the authority it gave him and because of what he carried because of it. So he would have been one of those people who would have fallen under the judgment of God and been destroyed. But Jesus saw him as lost because he knew who he was meant to be. And so when, when, we, when we read the New Testament, we need to remember that there was no Bible in those days. When, they, when Jesus and his disciples quoted scripture, they were quoting from the, from the Torah from the Old Testament, 
from, from the Jewish writings. That's what they were quoting. So everything in the New Testament has already been prophesied and promised in the Old Testament. So to disregard the old for the new is not going to, it's going to give you half a picture. We need to read both. That was just a little <laughs> point I wanted to make in between. Because some people seem to think the Old Testament, you know, was then and it's not now. But And I feel quite strongly about that, that, you know, that God is a God of the Old Testament and the New Testament. He's the God of Genesis and the God of Revelation. You know, he's the beginning and the end. He tells us that. So we need to, we need to read the whole story and get the whole picture. But I think the story of Zacchaeus just tells me that Zacchaeus, he chose life. He repented. And then he put action to his repentance. And he provided restitution. And I think that sometimes, as Christians, we forget that actions have consequences. You know, God forgives us for everything. Our sin is covered by the blood of the Lamb as far as the east is from the west, the deepest sea. God forgive, forgives and he puts it away from him. But it doesn't mean that we don't face the consequence of the sin or the choice or the decision. And sometimes we think that, you know, becoming a Christian or being forgiven means that there shouldn't be any consequences. And there are some consequences that God does save us from. Definitely, definitely. But there are some consequences that we need to walk out because of choices we've made. But they, it's not bad, it's not awful, because we do it with Jesus. So what you need to do, if you don't know, and look, there are a million like name books and name things out there. But if you don't know what your name means, go and find out. Look it up. And look up lots of different sources because, um, you know, some names go way back to, you know, pr um, other countries and other cultures and they have different meanings. Get, get, a, get a good picture of what your name means. And then ask God. Ask God to, to speak into your name. You know, a name is a covenant. It's a, it's a, a covenant that, that, that God makes with you before you're even born when he gives you a name. And ask him about your name. Ask him what it means. Ask him to, to speak into it and to tell you what, what it is that you carry just by virtue of what he named you. And if you feel like your name doesn't fit you or you have an anxiety about it, chat to your folks you, if they're still alive. You know, ask them, like my friend did. You know, what's, what, what was it? What, what did I, what, what, was there something else I was supposed to be called? Maybe your second name should have been your first name and then it got twisted around. Names are important. Zacchaeus needed to become pure. Zacchaeus the pure. And he could make the, the, the transition from being Zacchaeus the hated, despised tax collector to Zacchaeus the pure. So find out what it means. Look into that. Ask the Holy Spirit to give you wisdom and insight and revelation into what your name means. And then never forget that there are people walking around in the world today. Every single person has got a name from God, has got a destiny, has got a purpose in the kingdom, and God loves each and every one of them. And there might be someone who crosses your path today, and it is their appointed time to meet with Jesus and you are the person or you are the tool that God is going to use to actually draw them into that appointed time. People search. Sometimes it's that word of knowledge, that out of the blue word that tells them that God sees them, that God knows them, that brings them into a divine encounter with Jesus that leads them then to enter repentance and to take the action of turning away from who the world and the enemy told them they were into who Jesus tells them they are. Don't be afraid to step out. If you get it wrong, laugh. Say, I'm practicing. I'm practicing hearing from the Lord. <laughs> that, will put, that will keep anybody quiet. <laughs> just say, I'm practicing hearing from God. Is this, you know, but I just bless you today 
with everything that your name carries. All the authority, all the gifting, all the calling, all the anointing that your name carries, I bless you with that today. And I just speak courage over you in Jesus' name. And I break off that fear of man that stops you from stepping out. And I just speak boldness. Step out. Look for the people. Ask God to show you who he has appointed to step into a relationship with Jesus today. Go out. Do it. Let me know how it went. Even if it didn't work, let me know how it went anyway. <laughs> Love you all. And I'll see you next time.